angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy, eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. When most of us think of time at all, it's usually when we're running late for an appointment or perhaps when the alarm clock jolts you from a sound sleep too early in the morning. Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. But time is much more than that. It is, in fact, according to our guest tonight, the operating system upon which God has written his plan for our salvation. He's in the guest's chair tonight instead of the... Uh, the chair in which I sit. He is a writer, a teacher, broadcaster, and the host of Skywatch TV. But tonight, as guest, he's here in his capacity as the author of the fascinating book, Time Travelers of the Bible, How the Ancient Prophets Shattered the Time Barrier. And it's our honor to welcome Gary Stearman back to Skywatch TV. Derek, it's good to be with you once again. Exciting things to talk about. It, indeed. Uh, is that chair just as comfortable as this one? I, I don't... Actually, you make it very comfortable. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> well, thank you. I take that as high praise. <laughs> You really bring out some fascinating concepts about the nature of time, which is something most of us, I don't think, really consider often enough since we're promised a, a home in glory, in eternity someday, right. uh, which is going to fundamentally change the nature of our existence, moving from a linear time space into one in which there, you know, linear time really has no meaning. Mm -hmm. um, but in the time space in which we, we, that we currently occupy, uh, you draw out some very interesting concepts in your book, uh, Time Travelers of the Bible. For example, in, in the book of Revelation, um, and, and looking to the book of Revelation, you describe time as a, uh, uh, a, as a cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, wh what do you mean by that? Well, I feature time. Actually, it's not me that's doing it. The Bible features time as both a circle and a cycle. That, that is to say, when you go around a circle, uh, you have completed a, a spatial object once the circle is complete. But if you go around again, you've completed another revolution and again and another revolution and again. And, and time operates cyclically. And the Jews have, have an extremely uh, well-developed consciousness of this fact. Uh, for example, in Simcha Torah, Rejoicing with the Torah, is a festival in the Hebrew calendar where the elders of Israel uh, hold up the Torah scrolls and they begin to dance and sing while marching in a circle. And they go round and round and round the circle. Mm -hmm. And as they do, they recite scripture. And this is a reminder to them that, that God is, is working out the redemption of man. And he's doing it in a way that's far beyond human understanding. The circle then is a series of cycles. And in, uh, in my book, Time Travels of the, Travelers of the Bible, I, I point out that we see this exact same thing in the book of Revelation. Hmm. We see the seven churches of Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. Ephesus, which is the church, the, the initial church of uh, evangelical zeal in the first century. And then you come to Smyrna, the church that is giving way to paganism. Uh, Pergamos, the church that has intermarried with the world. And you, you come to the church of Thyatira, and it is the church of idolatry. And the next one is uh, Sardis. And wow, Sardis has gone completely over the hill. It's dead church. And then you have Philadelphia, the church comes back to life, and Laodicea. Mm -hmm. And Laodicea is the church going to seed after God has blessed it and it's come to life and, and it goes to seed. And, uh, and that is, that's the end of the story. Well, no, it's not. You turn the page back to where you were and you start the whole cycle over again. And this has been the, uh, the characteristic of the church age, these cycles repeating. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, you turn the page, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Mm -hmm. Time and time again, we see these cycles repeating, and they're repeating today. We have seen the church of evangelical zeal go to seed mm -hmm. in our day, the mm -hmm. church of Laodicea. Right. So 
what we have is the seven churches as a linear uh, layout of time. But they're also cyclical. All during the church age, these cycles have repeated themselves over and over and over again. And this is the way that time is, is depicted in the Bible, just the way the Jews always depicted it in their celebrations. And, and, and we even see, see pictures of that in, in the Old Testament because we see the pattern over and over again recorded through the books of uh, Judges and right. the Chronicles and Kings and Samuel of, of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Hebrews mm-hmm. uh, being oppressed and crying out, repenting, calling on God for, for their salvation. Uh, he he uh, uh, saves them from their enemies. They, they are thankful and then they begin to fall away and then they begin to intermarry with the foreign nations around them, begin to worship I, the, the foreign idols and so forth and until once again, the cycle is repeated. So it, it's something that appears to be a, a given all through, through history. Now, you add another element of, of uh, interest to this, and that is that you have seven churches, and this is the opening uh, of the book of Revelation, which is a book of sevens. Mm-hmm. You know, you have seven seals, and seven trumpets, and seven vials, and sevens in the book of Revelation are just practically too numerous to to count. We don't have time enough to talk about Mm -hmm, them. mm -hmm. But what you end up with is, and I'm not the first one to have pointed this out, is that in a book of 22 chapters, the book of Revelation, you have a repetition of sevens. And if you divide uh, 22 by seven, you come up with (laughs) 3.14. Pi, yes. Pi, which is the circle. Right. And this sends you back to a number of different places in the Bible, but pi is a transcendental number, 3.1415927, and and they have figured it out now to several hundred thousand decimal places, and the number never comes to an end. Yeah, you always have a remainder. You always have a remainder, and that for this reason, pi is called the transcendental number. That's what mathematicians call it. Right. And Revelation, is the transcendental book. <laughs> and you have a wonderful picture of time space in the book of Revelation. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it's, uh, there are a couple of references to a, a very special book, the book of life. Yes. How does that relate to the concept of time? Well, in the Bible, uh, the highest... Uh, I guess a, a ward that one can possibly imagine is to be written in the book of life or called in the New Testament the Lamb's book of life. And to be written in the book of life uh, literally means to be permanently inscribed in something that transcends time. That's hmm. to say the book of life is not a time limited book. It's an eternal book. And to be written in the book of life, then, is to have your life lifted out of time and written into eternity. And so time, seen in this way, is the mechanism that is used to prepare you for uh, a a residency in eternity. Hmm. And, and so when I read Revelation and I see all the sevens, you know, and then 22, and then I see 3.14, and I see pi, and the idea of squaring the circle, and, and the idea of a transcendental number, and then I think of how Revelation ends with the, with the mention of the books of life, plural, and, and suddenly, wow, I'm looking at a, uh, at a transcendental uh, series of events from the perspective of one trapped in time, because just like you, I'm mm-hmm. trapped in time right now, and I, I'm wearing a watch, and if I look at my watch, it's ticking off the seconds, and those measure my life. Mm-hmm. But what does that mean? Well, it just means that, that I'm on my way toward transcending time and entering eternity. Mm-hmm. And, and the Bible is the only book on planet Earth that talks about that particular fact. Hmm. In fact, as, as we were discussing before the, the program today, you um, commented that uh, time, in a sense, is the operating system upon which God's creation, as we perceive it, mm-hmm. operates, uh, functions. Uh, you know, it, it, ex- expand on that a little bit. What do you mean by that? Well, an operating system, and of course, you know, we go back just a few decades before a few decades ago, there were no such things as operating systems, you know, mm-hmm. computer systems. And the reason you write an operating system is to have a platform 
upon which to play out other events that you put into your computer, whether they be financial events or uh, re historical records or whatever you want to put in there. They have to be put, laid out on this software operating system platform. And that's exactly the way I see the Bible and, and time itself. Time is, if you will, an artificial structure. God said, I created the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46, for the purpose of laying out my entire redemptive program. It has an end, it has a beginning, and right in the middle is the cross of Christ, mm -hmm. which, by the way, uh, is in itself a transcendental uh, thought. That is, you think of a cross as a crude wooden instrument of, of uh, state uh, execution, mm -hmm. Roman state execution. But God in Colossians uh, has Paul write the words that, that the cross was effectual not only in, uh, on earth but in heaven. The cross pierces through all of the dimensions, solves the problem of sin, and it it's based upon this entire operating system that we call time. That leads to a question about um, the symmetry of time. And you call this your, your favorite part of your book, Time Travelers of the Bible. Why is that? Well, if you look at, and we think about dispensationalism, and sometimes we call ourselves dispensationalists, and, and we think of time uh, as being laid out uh, along a certain line. You have the uh, dispensation of innocence and then of conscience and of human government, of promise and law and grace and then the coming kingdom. Seven dispensations generally, as they're generally expressed. And uh, you think of, of those dispensations as successive dispensations usually, and yet they aren't. Uh, what they are is a, a harmonic uh, foundation, if you will, upon which God uh, bases his healing, if you will, of a very sick planet. And let me read something in Ephesians that just really illustrates this. Uh, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, the mystery of his will. Wow, what a, what a phrase. What is the mystery of God's will? According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. In other words, God said, I'm going to do something. Mm -hmm. The next sentence is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, hmm. he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him. This just says it. It says that the dispensations as laid out along this timeline <clears throat> will conclude in the fullness of times, plural, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, that is in Christ. And if you could just visualize this, this is a marvelous expression of what we're talking about. An operating system, a timeline that, that is, uh, if you will, marked off in dispensations, and when it comes to its fullness, uh, all of the uh, elements of heaven and earth are going to be pulled together into one unity. Right now, I, I think it's safe to say the universe is a broken universe. It's, it's disunity. Mm -hmm. th thanks to, to Satan himself, you know, who rebelled and, and who uh, created a, a process of breaking up uh, the reign of God for his own uh, prophet. And God said, no, I'm going to repair this. And I'm going to do it by creating a timeline. I'm going to send my only begotten son at a particular point that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, everything's going to be rectified. Things in heaven, things in earth. Now, what a concept. And really, this is the center idea or the central feature in, in, in this book that I, that I put together, Time Travelers of the Bible. It's, it, it, I think, it is, is an attempt on my part, and I think at times it's a very feeble attempt to show uh, how God uses time as a tool. As you said in the book of Isaiah, uh, declared the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, the, the concept of time is woven into the very fabric of the Bible. Um, 
but as you mentioned, Satan and his minions have tried to hijack God's creation, have tried mm-hmm. to derail, perhaps, the concept of time. Um, they have. And, they and really uh, have. There, there's a fascinating chapter in your book, Time Travelers of the Bible, in which you describe what you call, uh, if I can get the name correct here, transdimensional raiders. This sounds like something from a science fiction movie, but it's real. But it's real. And it's fascinating. I first became aware of this uh, when thinking about the way the devil works, as described in the Bible. And you go back to Job, and you, you see this meeting in, he- in heaven where... Uh, Satan is meeting with God uh, you know, at, at some sort of a celestial round table. And Job is in question, and we all know that story of how Satan was allowed to uh, persecute Job. And, and, but what we have there is an, a, a very uh, uh, selective view of uh, the, the biblical view of heaven and earth. Obviously, uh, Satan and, and the Lord were in one dimensional area. They were looking at Job in another dimensional area. And the the Lord allows Satan to persecute Job on several levels, which means that he can uh, step out of eternity into time and do his worst. Hmm. Well, so do his demons, those that come, that he, whom he commands. And as you come into the New Testament and you see the work of all sorts of uh, demonic personages, you, you begin to develop an idea that from time to time, demons or dark forces can sort of pop into this dimension, if you will, and then pop back out again. And that's why I call them transdimensional raiders. They're moving from the dimension of eternity into the dimension of time. From and. And it's fascinating that the ancient Greeks, for example, uh, Hesiod, Plato, uh, uh, various other philosophers and historians expressed this very same idea, that, except they had a different view of the demons. Which in Greek, they call them diamon. In English, it's demon. And they said, the demons are our friends, and we should leave offerings for them mm-hmm. so that when they do pop through, they'll receive our offerings and they will be pleased and they will not do us any harm and they'll pop back into their own uh, little world and every, everybody will be happy for a time. And so the Greeks busied themselves with making the demons happy, pleasing the demons by leaving little offerings or by worshiping certain gods. Uh, but they viewed uh, the demons as transdimensional characters who could come into this dimension and do good or evil, depending on uh, how well you had managed to please them. Mm -hmm. Well, as we come into the Bible, the Bible's view is entirely different, of course. (laughs) They are not our friends. Right. In fact, we don't receive blessing from the demons at all. We go uh, uh, several notches higher than that. But the fact is, they are still doing their worst, and they can pop into this time zone and pop back out again. And... We have the protection of the Holy Spirit. We have the protection of the Lord. And we look at them entirely differently than the Greeks did. Nevertheless, we still recognize their presence. Hmm. Now, you call them transdimensional. How do the demons and these other dark forces in the universe experience time? I think they're lost, quite frankly. To a very great degree, uh, demons are hapless, defeated creatures who are eking out a living in the best way they can. Jesus describes them in the New Testament as looking for lodging and, and uh, in, in, a, in a wasteland. And when they find it, they latch onto it. Well, he was talking about demons inhabiting human beings. And when they're cast out of a human being uh, by a superior power, namely the power of the Holy Spirit, they're wandering creatures in some dimension, uh, trackless desert waste looking for another home. So their lives are not beautiful lives. They are the accursed uh, spirits of God's judgment from earlier ages. Uh, but nevertheless, they, they are uh, able in some way, under some circumstances, if allowed to, to penetrate that dimensional barrier between eternity and time. Hmm. We, we see in, in Job, the early chapters, a uh, depiction of God consulting with his divine counsel. Uh, Satan is allowed his presence there uh, to accuse the brethren. Uh, 
mm-hmm. uh, to accuse Job. Uh, we see other examples in, in the Bible of God uh, talking to uh, the, the angels in heaven. So we, right. we get an idea that there is an existence that we normally don't perceive. Right. Um, what, what sphere does heaven occupy then? Is it outside of time or is it simply a parallel universe? You know, it, it, again, and I've asked myself this many times, how will we perceive time in heaven? Obviously, we will, because when uh, uh, we read of John going to heaven, the book of Revelation, he enters a door uh, into the future. He travels to the future, and there he experiences time because he speaks of times, like something lasting about 30 minutes. And, uh, and, and so he's, he speaks of things happening along a timeline. So obviously, there's some kind of a time measurement in heaven probably different than the, the way we measure time on planet Earth, and, but, but that's pretty much an unanswerable question, except to say that eventually the heavens and the Earth are going to be uh, recrafted, consolidated into one unity, a- and that's the purpose of the cross of Christ, to, to mend that which was broken. So. Mm-hmm. The way I view time is that at the end of God's time sequence, and he's, he says there will be an end. In fact, the word time no longer, the phrase time no longer appears in the book of Revelation. A- at the end of what we call time, leading to the new heavens and the new earth, I think there's going to be a different calculation. Hmm. And I think that we will go into an eternity uh, in the presence of God. The only reason to think about time right now is to think of God's purpose. He uses time to redeem. And that's a marvelous thing. In other words, he created time for a purpose. And that purpose was to provide a platform Hmm. for the cross of Christ. So if time had not been created and the fall had happened in that that time-space called eternity, mankind might have been lost for eternity. You could speculate, speculate on it that way for mm, sure. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's something to think about. Mm. But one thing we do know for sure, and it says it all the way through the Bible, that the cross is, was a, an instrument of redemption, but it's a universal instrument of redemption, not merely uh, fixed in time space. I suppose if you could visualize it, it would be some kind of a hyperdimensional uh, device of some sort that radiated the, the, the love of God throughout the entire creation. Hmm. And uh, that's about as far as I can go in my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you began researching this with an eye to uh, exploring the, the implications of time, the creation, the passing of time, the differences between our linear time and God's eternal time, mm-hmm. what was the most surprising discovery that you encountered? You know, I think the most surprising discovery was when I became accustomed to thinking about the word time, it suddenly hit me how much of the Bible is devoted to this subject. Time and time again. (laughs) Time after time. (laughs) All the way through the Bible you find references to God's manipulation of time and time space in order to create something that he wants to create at any given moment. And why, for example, did he pluck up Elijah at one point in time and somehow transport him forward and he becomes a New Testament character? And in fact, not only physically at the Mount of Transfiguration, but but Jesus said uh, of John the Baptist, this was Elijah, if you can hear it. The spirit of Elijah resided in John the Baptist, Mm -hmm. who was the annunciator for 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 Christ. You know, he announced the coming of Christ in the spirit of Elijah, and so the Lord is using Elijah along the timeline at 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 various stages in ways that we can't possibly understand, except to say that the, the Lord is the master of time space. There are those who may look at this book and say, okay, Gary Stearman is a a Bible teacher. He's been a pastor for many years. Why is he even looking at the concept of time and space instead of just focusing on the cross and him crucified? Mm -hmm. How would you answer that? Because 
or Christ once, and him crucified rather. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because once you begin to, to be conscious of time as a quantity external from yourself, in other words, most of us are trapped in time. Oh dear, I'm late, I'm late, you know. And, and that's the way we think of time. Once you begin to remove yourself one notch from time and look at what the Bible says about time, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God is going to, to uh, actually restore the universe, the broken universe, and, and suddenly you, be, you begin to see time as something other than yourself and your own preoccupations. It's a marvelous thing that God created for the purpose of redemption. Mm. And then you will reread your Bible and you'll say, wow, what a wonderful God we have. Yeah. Just another reminder of the incredible creation that God has put, uh, has put us in the middle of for his own purposes. Uh, time Travelers of the Bible can be yours, and we'd like to offer it as part of a special package. We'll call it the Time Travelers Package from Skywatch TV. Log on to skywatchtv.com, and you'll get a copy of Gary Stearman's book, Time Travelers of the Bible, How the Ancient Prophets Shattered the Time Barrier, along with a book that's been out of print for many, many years, written in the 19th century by George H. Pember, considered a classic, Earth's Earliest Ages, a chronology of the creation um, and how the enemy tried to uh, derail, hijack, if you will, God's creation. George H. Pember, Earth's Earliest Ages and Time Travelers of the Bible by Gary Stearman. Yours for $29.95 from Skywatch TV. Log on now, skywatchtv.com. Gary, I will gladly relinquish the chair back to you, sir, but it has been an honor and a pleasure talking with you and uh, thank you for your work, your teachings, and especially for your book, Time Travelers of the Bible. Well, Derek, I have enjoyed the time. <laughs> for Skywatch TV, I'm Derek Gilbert. The supernatural realm is real, and we humans are naturally curious about it. That's why there are so many television reality shows featuring ghost hunters and alien chasers and mediums and psychics. But by definition, we Christians believe in the supernatural, and yet most churches avoid these controversial topics. Our mission here at Skywatch TV is to address these topics of the paranormal and the supernatural from a biblical perspective. This is, after all, the authoritative book on the subject. But we depend on your help to do it. To find out more on how you can support Skywatch TV, prayerfully and financially, log on to our website, skywatchtv.com. Our mission also to keep you informed through news items we think are important and the latest news updates about Skywatch TV. You can follow those on the internet, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, various other places. And of course, all of our programs, if you can't watch them live, are archived at our website and our official YouTube channel. You can find all the places where you can see Skywatch TV and follow us on the internet at skywatchtv.com slash web. And of course, you can watch our programming anytime, day or night, on demand through Roku. For instructions on how to add our Roku channel to your Roku account, log on to skywatchtv.com slash Roku. And keep watching as we keep watch at Skywatch TV. <laughs>